the Lord our God. You are our teacher, our salvation, and our savior. Help us listen and learn from your word today, so we may be closer to you, so we may be the salt and the light of the world, and in so doing so, we can be good. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts will be acceptable. Continuing on, um, last week we didn't really get into it any further, but we heard the Beatitudes, the blessings, those are blessed. Uh, the next piece of that is Matthew 5, verse 13 through 20. The first part, verse 13a, if you will, Jesus told his disciples, You are the salt of the earth. The you sets the listeners apart from other people, the scribes and the Pharisees. Who are not the salt of the earth. We'll get to the scribes and the Pharisees a little later. The you, a you are salt of the earth, is plural, and thus describes the church. Christ calls us both individually and collectively to be the salt of the earth. Note that Jesus does not say, You will be the salt of the earth. He didn't say, you have it within you to become the salt of the earth. He said, you are the salt of the earth. Indicating that by God's grace, the miracle of our transformation is our future. You are the salt of the earth. Disciples are like salt because they are precious. In Jesus' day, salt was a very valued commodity. Roman soldiers would even get paid sometimes with salt, giving rise to the phrase, worth the salt. You are the salt of the earth. Disciples are like salt because they have a preserving influence. Salt was used to preserve meats and to slow decay. Christians should have a preserving influence on their culture. You are the salt of the earth. Disciples are like salt because they add flavor. Christians should be a flavorful people. Salt has very little influence while sitting in salt shakers. However, it is of great value once it is mixed in the right portions in our food. When it is sprinkled on the food, or better yet, when it is cooked into that food, it transforms the food. So also, Christians sitting in the comfort of their own homes are unlikely to make much difference to the people outside their doors, the people who need Christ. It is as we interact with others, both Christians and non-Christians, that we have the opportunity to bring a Christ-like flavor to their lives. However, we must always stay alert so that we impart a Christ-like flavor to them rather than allowing them to impart attitudes, activities, or other things that have no religious or spiritual basis to our lives. People value salt. They use it not only for seasoning, but also as a preservative for food. Grains of salt are very small. But salt's usefulness exceeds its size. Salt is inexpensive, but as we learn, we would still require it, not only to enhance and to preserve our food, but also to sustain life. Salt then is a perfect metaphor for the people of God. We have a responsibility to transform the environment which we find ourselves in, just as salt transforms food. We are often few in number, but that doesn't matter. Just as a few grains of salt can make a big difference in food, a few faithful Christians can make a big difference in this world. The second part of verse 13, Jesus said, But if salt has lost its taste, 
how can its saltiness be restored? Salt must keep its saltiness to be of any value. Jesus warned us not to be complacent. If salt loses its taste, it becomes worthless. Salt cannot change its own chemical composition, but it does lose its taste and its value if it is diluted by adding other substances to it, especially paint. In the same way, Christians can lose their flavor and become good for nothing. When that happens, we cease to become the salt of the earth and become what? Continuing on in 13. No longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled on foot. In verse 14, Jesus continues saying that you are the light of the world. This means that we are not only the light receivers, but the light givers. We must have a greater concern in this life than just ourselves. We cannot live only for ourselves. We must have someone to shine to and do so lovingly. Jesus never challenged us to become salt or light. He simply said, we are. And we are either fulfilling or failing that good responsibility. In verses 14, 15, and 16, Jesus said, No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works, and give glory to your Father in heaven. Like lamps, disciples have a purpose. We are to live in such a way that our good deeds, our good works, give glory to God. As Christians, our life is derived from our relationship with Christ. Our life is not our own life. It is the reflection of Jesus' life. Good works are in keeping with the principle of Christian love. If we love one another, our love will be manifested in acts of mercy. Such acts are highly effective ways to give God glory. Christ intends each of us to be light, some small, some large, but all of us shine bright. If every Christian had his or her light on all the time, it would be a very good. The purpose of these good works is not to garner personal honors, but instead to give glory to our Father in heaven. Everything in our ministry needs to point to him. In verse 17, Jesus said, Don't think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. Jesus here began a long discussion of the law and wanted to make it clear that he did not oppose the law that God gave Israel and what we have as the Old Testament. He did not come to destroy the word of God, but to free it from the way the Pharisees and the scribes had wrongly interpreted it. In verse 18, he said, For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not even one smallest letter or one tiny stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Jesus wanted to make it clear that he had the authority apart from the law of Moses, but not in contradiction to it. Jesus added nothing to the law except one thing that no man had ever added to the law. Perfect obedience. This is certainly one way that Jesus came to fulfill the law. Jesus here told us not only the ideas of the Word of God are important, but also the, the letters and the words themselves. Even the letters and the words are very important, and this shows how highly God regards His Word. In verse 19, 
verse 19, he says, Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus doesn't offer uh, an option to champion one particular commandment and ignoring the other. If Jesus is to be the Lord of our lives, we must guide our lives by the totality of his teaching. We will, of course, never do perfectly in this life. But making Jesus and his teachings our North Star should be our goal. Jesus said in verse 20, For I tell you that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, there is no way you will enter the, into the kingdom of heaven. May I close with you back to the scribes and Pharisees? The scribes are priding themselves on their ability to interpret the law correctly, and the Pharisees prided themselves on keeping the law in all of its details. They represented the religious establishment of Israel, and Jesus challenged their authority and it became his moral enemy. Yeah. See, there's a number of problems with the scribes and the Pharisees. Different lessons in the Bible, but for you. They seek the glory that belongs to God, Matthew 6, verses 2 and 5. They honor God with their lips, but their hearts are far from him. They teach human precepts, not doctrine. They fail to observe weighty matters of law. While they look presentable on the outside, within, they are full of hypocrisy and inequity. And Jesus called them out. He called them hypocrites on several occasions. Verse 6, chapter 6, verse 5. Jesus called them hypocrites on the word. They're the greatest of their failures, however, is their own spiritual pride. Their inclination to preen themselves in their spiritual needs and congratulate themselves on the beautiful images they see reflected. They claim to honor God, but much of their energy is directed at self glory. It isn't easy to avoid the sins of the Pharisees and Pharisees. When we read about them, we're tempted to pray, God, thank you that I am not like them. When we do that, and that happens, we have adopted the same spirit of the In verse 20, Jesus demanded our righteousness exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. May we live our lives not like the scribes and Pharisees, but be the salt and the light. Let us honor and obey God's commandments, and in doing so, give the glory to God.